and I don't know if this is on. Last night it was on. I like to blew the window out of the building, but that's all right. Good, good to have each of you with us this evening. Now, it says in my program, I welcome you and to uh, tell you basically what's happening, our, our statement of purpose. And so I've practiced that all week, so I'm going to give you our statement of purpose. It is a time of celebration of Pentecost, what God has done for us, and the, the power of God that's present in this world today, just as it was in the first century, as it was when Acts was written. You're here to celebrate Pentecost, to be open to the moving of the Spirit, and at the end of the service, we will have a time for healing. If you'd like to come forward, uh, there will be an opportunity for you to come and uh, anointed with all, hands laid it on you, and prayer uh, for you. Uh, the needs, there are nine different kinds of prayer in the New Testament, whether it's the prayer of faith or the prayer of agreement, or it's the uh, prayer of supplication, or it's the uh, uh, prayer of intercession. Whichever it is, that kind of prayer will be prayed and will be prayed in faith. God will hear and God will respond. We thank everybody tonight, as well as those from previous nights, our special music. Uh, we thank our musician, and we thank those who do and take care of the technical work. Now, after our uh, time of prayer, then you will be invited to the table of our Lord by intention is how we will commune. The elders and deacons are in charge of that. And uh, then we'll go out for a time of fellowship in the fellowship hall, I mean, in the entryway. Uh, we do, I would like to thank personally um, Angel Lorton for being here tonight with us. When, uh, when you've been preaching kind of as long as I have since the dawn of human civilization, you have met a lot of wonderful, wonderful people. And Angel is one of them. When I called her, now she is the uh, education minister and music minister for uh, Broad Street Christian Church Disciples of Christ in Newburn. I called her and she said, just a minute. She said, we got choir practice, but I'll counsel, I'll be there, uh, which I do appreciate. But I will share this with you 20 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, she and her husband had their first baby. And it's, it's forever in my mind. And you would ask, why is that forever in your mind? The baby wasn't a week old. She came to a district meeting, sat down next to me. I said, you're out early, aren't you? Yeah, but I've got a report to give. And the baby, I mind you, this baby wasn't a week old yet. And we were sitting there, and she said, they're going to call me in just a minute to do the report. I said, well, aren't you going to have your pro a problem with your uh, holding the baby and giving the report? She said, no, and about that time, they called her name. She stood up, gave me the baby, and said, here. And, when, <laughs> and all of you know how many children I have. I said, as she went to the end of the pew, she, I said, what do I do? She said, it'll come natural. <laughs> I didn't drop the baby which has proven to be a good thing in that baby's life. But we do appreciate it, Angel, uh, being with us tonight as well as we appreciate each one of you and everything that's been done. We'll share with you any need that you have. This night, be, uh, we'll be here to pray with you and to pray about that need. The only one I shared with you last night that we will not pray for here is that you get a new uh, congregational care minister. If you want that prayer, you go down to the Baptist church and you pray that one down there. <laughs> Not here. God is going to bless us, change our life, and forever transform us this night. We've come to worship him. If you would, I believe it's going to be on the, the boards behind me, but if you would like, take your hymn book. May we turn to 261. May we stand and worship God. <laughs>
God. Hallelujah. Thank you. You may be seated. May we attend to the reading of the word of the living God. If you have your scripture, it is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your soul. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word. At this time, we'll invite the praise band to lead us in worship. Keep going. That was spirited. <laughs> Y'all know this. Y'all got to sing with us.
I'm thankful that I have seen the light. Praise the Lord. Glory. Anybody that's not ready after that can't preach. Of course, there are those who may say, I can't preach, but hey, you know. I've been practicing for 68 years, uh, uh, 40, excuse me, 48 years. I ought to get there. I ought to get there after a while. Praise God. Also would like to take this opportunity to thank those who took us out to supper every night that we were here this week. We appreciate that. Thank you so much. And many did ask after these other folks had asked. And I appreciate you for thinking about that and inviting us to go break bread with you. Also, we thank you for those who fixed the refreshments that are in the entryway. Lord bless you real good. As we look at this passage of Scripture, we look at first... There needs to be clarification. Just prior to the verses that we began with is where there's some instruction by St. Peter about masters and slaves. And there are those who the age of the church has misunderstood and misused this passage of Scripture to say that God institutionalized tyranny. That's incorrect. First of all, it's not the nature of God to institute or or give institution or credence to tyranny. That's not God's nature. That's not what God has done, is going to do, is doing now, or will do it any time. Secondly, when you keep Scripture in context, you'll see clearly what St. Peter is talking about. Jesus would not have approved of the institutionalizing of tyranny. He would not have approved of the institutionalized of slavery. And therefore, the scripture is not pro-slavery. The church through the generations has been pro-slavery, but it's not the first time the church has been wrong, and it will not be the last time the church is wrong. The scripture has never been wrong, and it will always be right. It is the firm foundation upon which we stand. If you'll take verses 21, 22, and 23, what God has done in Christ is institutionalized a new way to deal with tyranny. And we've seen it work in our generation. We've seen it work in India. We've seen it work in this nation and other nations. When we take God's new approach, the walls of tyranny and hatred and bitterness will come down, will be destroyed. But you've got to keep Scripture in line with Scripture. We're not to follow the church. We're to follow the Christ of the Word. And the Christ which we meet in the Word will reveal the nature and the mind of God and the purpose of God. When we talk about the Spirit of God, what is the Spirit of God? It is in His Word. God's Spirit is in His Word as your Spirit and my Spirit are embodied in our Word. If we tell you we're going to do something, we have made a life commitment in our word. We've made a life commitment of how we spend our time, our talent, and our resources, what we will do, what we will not do. We are inhabiting our word. God inhabits his word. Pentecost is where we understand and meet the spirit of that God that inhabits his word and that will break unto us an understanding of the revelation of his word. The church was also wrong about the position that the Bible takes on the role of women. You cannot do and believe what the church believed through the ages and believe the prophecy of Joel. You cannot take what Joel said and throw it aside. The problem is individuals go to the word with complete preconceived ideas, making the word speak to their situation, their circumstances, to the way they want it to. We are to go to the word of God based on two points. First of all, it's the word of God. That settles it. It's true. It's right. If it's a problem, it's us. Now, it doesn't mean we understand it all. doesn't mean we can comprehend it all. But the word's right no matter what. Secondly, we as individuals have got to go and let the word speak to us. Let the word come to us. No preconceived ideas. No preconceived judgments. We go to let the word speak to us. And as that word through the Spirit of God works in us, it'll transform us from glory unto glory. And that brings us to verse 24. 24 and 25 are wonderful Pentecost verses. The Bible tells us, Who his own self bore our sins in his body on the tree. We understand from Deuteronomy, anybody that uh, dies on a tree, they have 
received a curse. So the Bible tells us that Jesus was cursed because he died on a tree, taking our sins when he died on that tree. He took our sins and therefore the curse of the law was on him. It is no longer on us. When we receive Jesus Christ, we're set free from the curse of the law. For it was Jesus Christ who died on the cross, making himself a curse for us that you and I could go free. Jesus died twice on that cross. His first death was a spiritual death. And when he received my sins and your sins, he died spiritually, separated from the living God. Secondly, he died physically on that cross. He ascended into paradise where he preached the gospel to those who had died before the flood, crossed the gulf that could not be crossed into hell itself, where he suffered for my sins and your sins. And on a resurrection morning, it was God in glory that said divine justice had been satisfied, and Christ arose from hell. He lifted himself up on the floor of hell, shaking the worms off his his being, but the Bible tells us that's where the worm never dies. And he went to Satan and took the crown of life from him. And he kicked down the gates of hell. And he was raised triumphant and victorious over the curse of the law because he'd been made a curse for us so that you and I could go free. The curse of the law that he has delivered us from is the curse of sickness, the curse of spiritual death, and the curse of poverty. The Bible goes on and tells us in verse 24 that we, being dead to sin, you and I don't have to sin anymore when we receive Christ. You and I don't have to walk in sin. We become a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away and all things are new. As a new creature, we've been set free from that curse. We don't have that Adamic nature working in us any longer. We have the divine nature of God. His spirit and our spirit are in fellowship. His nature speaks to our born-again spirit. Zoe life is the life of God. And when we receive Jesus Christ, we become that new creature. We become the son and daughter of the living God with that life in us. And his life in us gives us the power of choice about sin. The Bible goes on and says, Should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we were healed. We are to live and we have the capability and the capacity to live a righteous separated life. It is not a hope that we try to do the very best we can. We're going to struggle along and do just the best we can, and we're going to bear up, and then one day it's going to get better in the sweet by and by. Sweet by and by is right now, and it's good now. To know Jesus Christ is good now, and it's going to get better when we get to heaven, but it's good right now. We know in whom we have believed and we're persuaded beyond all doubt that he's able to keep all that we've committed to him against that day of judgment. He has delivered us from the curse of the law. We have his life in us. We are the sons and daughters of God. We are as Christian as we're ever going to be. Each one of us, when we were born of our earthly parents, we were as a human as we were ever going to be. You're not going to get more human at 20. You're not going to become more human at 30. You're human, you're human. When you're born again by the blood of the Lamb, you're a Christian. You're a good Christian, maybe not such a good Christian, maybe even a better Christian, maybe kind of a bad Christian. But if you know Jesus Christ, you are a new creature in Christ. And as a new creature in Christ, you've got the capability and the capacity to walk in the light as he's in the light. We have a choice about the practice of sin. We have a choice about the practice of the brokenness of this world. We have a choice about being the son and daughter of God, the caliber of son and daughter of God that we want to be. For we have the capability to be righteous, redeemed. He has reckoned us righteous, and he has made us actually righteous. There's a great deal of debate in some theological circles about being reckoned righteous or actually being righteous. Now, yes, we are reckoned first, righteous. That's grace, unmerited favor. You and I could do nothing to save ourselves. We were lost and we were broken and we were undone. We could do nothing. So God so loved that he gave. And Jesus Christ, where the angels came and said, peace on earth. That peace was in Christ and it was between fallen man and God. I, the angels said, I got some good news for y'all. And that good news is that God in 
in Christ has made peace with you by solving your problem for you that you could not solve. And he solved that problem for us that he, we could not solve through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now, because it's grace, it's been reckoned to us. It's been given to us. And we are actually righteous when we receive him, we become that new creature. We become someone that's right-wise unto God. We're able to walk and talk in that new Jerusalem way. We're able to give to God glory and praise. We're able to be the glory of God upon this earth, the visible image. We're able to speak in a manner that this world must hear. For we are the children of God. This world must respond to. For we are the children of God. Our heavenly father El Shaddai. Is walking with us. And he's talking with us. And he's making a way where there is no way. For that curse is broken over us. As much as we know about his word. Is as much of the light that we have to walk in. The more word. The more light. The more word. The more power of God. The more word. The more we live free from the curse of the law of sin and death. More we live in the liberty that God has prepared for us. And we are not waiting till we get to heaven to be the Christian. We're not waiting till we get to heaven to enjoy the life he saved us to. We're going to shout the victory from the day that we were touched by the hand of Christ and set free till the time we leave this earth and we see our God face to face. We're going to shout the victory. We're going to live in the victory. We're going to live a life that testifies to who we are in Christ. Now the devil does go around seeing who he can devour, but we are those he cannot. And we've chosen to be that way. Satan will test us and tempt us and try us. But greater is he this in us than he this in this world. We are world overcomers because Christ in us overcomes in every situation and every circumstance. We're going to live that right wise life. We're going to live in that relationship with God that when the world takes counsel of us, they will say, these people have been with that man called Jesus and you are right. We have been with him. He is in us and we are the children of the living God. He goes on and says in verse 25, for ye were as sheep gone astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your soul. The word bishop and shepherd I'd like for us to spend some time on. And yes, I know that you, you got to get out by 12 o'clock tonight. I understand that. With that said, when we look at Pentecost and we look at the power of God that's on this earth and we understand what God has done for us in salvation, ours is not a hope so, try so, maybe so thing. I was physically born. There was no doubt in my parents' life. There was no doubt in John Bonner's life. I was born on this earth. No doubt in my life now either. And I know that I've been born again by the blood of the Lamb. There's no doubt in my heart. There's no doubt in my mind. And I do know when that day comes, I lay down this mortal tabernacle for the last time on this side. He will lift me up on the other. Now, I may not have been the perfect Christian. I may not have been a good Christian. I may not even been almost good. But I'm going to tell you what, I was there. I was there the day that God quickened me. I was there the day that God called me. I was there the day that glory came down and joy filled my heart when I became that new creature, washed in the blood of the Lamb, sanctified whole by that precious blood and filled with His glorious Holy Ghost. Pentecost happened and the church was born and Pentecost happens every day in the life of a believer, in the life of those who put their hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. He will steal the troubled waters of our soul every day in our life. Pentecost occurs every day. This world hungers to see and know the reality of individuals and a congregation and a church that's on fire for the glory of God. A real fire, a real burning, a real manifestation of His grace. And He tells us about that with the word shepherd. We know that Palestine is not the easiest place to live, or Israel. That there is a, a plain, a shelf more or less, that has some grass, not a whole lot. And it was the responsibility of the shepherd to see that the, the uh, herd, the sheep, were fed. That they would move from place to place. That they would 
fine grass. They would be able to eat grass and they would be nourished. It was his responsibility to see that they would find water sufficient to drink. And at night, it was his responsibility to see that they would be kept in a group and not scattered and that the wolves and other animals, wild animals, wouldn't come in and devour them. And his was a great responsibility because they had a desert on one side, they had a cliff on the other, and they had a cliff on the It was just that little plane, that little shelf, wasn't the safest place to be. But it was the shepherd's responsibility to see they were nourished, to see that they kept together, and to see that they were protected from the wiles of the enemy. We have a good shepherd Jesus the Christ. We have a good shepherd, the living God, and he will see that our physical needs are met. He will see that we're protected from the wiles of the enemy. He will see that we are sustained in this journey. He will see that in every difficulty and every situation and every circumstance, we are able. We're able to meet the challenge. We're able. We're able to overcome the challenge. Pentecost is realizing that that good shepherd is in us. That good shepherd is with us. That good shepherd shall sustain us. That good shepherd shall deliver us. That good shepherd shall see that in every situation and circumstance that this broken, sin-cursed world puts before us, that we're able to face that challenge and overcome. The Bible goes on and says, not only is he a shepherd, he is the bishop. Now, bishop can mean a lot of things. You and I aren't familiar with bishops. We're part of a denomination that doesn't have them. But we all maybe know some bishops. But that's, that's not what this word means, thank God. This word means a multitude of things. Historically, it has a beautiful history, an interesting history. It, it was a bishop was someone set to make sure that terms of a treaty were kept. Both sides kept the terms of the treaty. It was also one that were to take care of the physical needs. See, everybody had food and a shelter. And also, a bishop was someone to ensure that there would be harmony. The bishop was to ensure justice and that those who did not live by just means paid the price. But those who did live by just means would be protected. A bishop was the one who was to care for the emotional, the psychological, the physical, the spiritual, the cultural, the social needs that were in their life. Now, the Bible tells us in this passage of Scripture, we've got a bishop. Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Christ and our Heavenly Father are going to take care of us. They're going to meet our needs. Pentecost promises us the Spirit of God The Spirit of God gives us the fullness of the revelation of everything that heaven has. We have a right in Christ. We have a right to every promise that God has made to us. The Bible is a covenant with us. We didn't make it. God did. God made it and gave it to us. And when we yielded and said, yes, we received that covenant, God made us new creatures and we can stand in the presence of God. We can stand in the presence of Satan. We can stand in the presence of those upon this earth in Jesus Christ. And we can say, yes, because of Christ, we're worthy of heaven's best. And every promise that God made, every jot and tittle of that covenant, he will fulfill. We, by faith, ask for no more and we'll settle for no less than what our covenant agreement with Almighty God is. And in that covenant agreement, we are free from fear. We're free from worry. We're free from doubt. We're free from unbelief. We're free from the problems that this world is betangled in. And just because we live in the world doesn't mean we have to have the problems the world does. Just because we live in the world, it does not mean that we have to be sucked in to the despair, disappointment, and hopelessness, and discouragement, and unhappiness of this world. Individuals, and you know, you can tell an unhappy person, you were walking down the road and it looked like they were baptized in prune juice. You know that is not a happy person. Right off. You know, you may, you may speak to them and they may grunt back. They may not. You may wish they had just grunted back after they get through. Joy fills us. Now, yes, when loved ones die, we, I, we have tears because we're going to miss them. 
But God's joy sustains us. God's peace sustains us. God is the bishop of our soul, our spirit, and our body. God is the shepherd of our spirit, our soul, and our body. And God has delivered us from the curse of the law. God has delivered us from all that is under the curse of the law. Everything that the law says is going to come upon those who violate it. God has delivered us through Christ Jesus. We have a bishop and we have a good shepherd or a shepherd that will lead us to the valley of the shadow of death and we're not going to fear any evil. He's going to prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies and he's going to see that we are sustained in this journey and that as we witness for him, as we let the glory of heaven fill our soul and light the world about us, that others will see and know a risen Christ that will transform and that will set free. There will be times that the world will have shortages that you and I will not worry about it. There will be a time that the world is afraid and we will not be afraid. There will be a time that the broken, sin-cursed world will tell us that sin and debauchery and rebellion and self-service is the best way to live. But we know better. We know better not because of great wisdom that we have. We know better not because we as individuals have achieved something on our own. We know better because we've been to Calvary. And that touch of the Master's hand prepared us to receive the fullness of His Spirit. And that Spirit fills us. We are the vessels of the Holy Ghost. And as the vessels of the Holy Ghost, we will not be moved. We will not be persuaded to turn back. And we will not quit. We do not stop with nine innings. We play till we win. We do not quit until we have the victory and we can serve notice on Satan and all of the fallen angels and we can serve notice on those who have attacked Christianity and seek to destroy it, we are not going to be moved. The church was here before you and I arrived and the body of Jesus Christ, the true church, will be here if Jesus tarries uh, when we're gone. But if he doesn't tarry, the witness will be here. The witness will be here that we were. But if he goes and calls us home before he comes to claim his bride, the church will continue to stand. We can serve notice not in an ugly, arrogant, self-righteous, pious way, but in the true humility that Christ had, the true humility that Paul and Peter and James and John had, which is simply, we love you just like you are but we are not changing and wrong is a problem we do not have but we love you just like you are and if you want to you can be like us if you want to you can look in the lion's face you can look in the devil's face and say you, you, you're not moving us you can chew all you want to but you're not moving us you can bite all you want to but we're not moving us for we know we know what God has done. We know that God cannot fail. We know God. And because we know God Almighty, we will never turn back and we will never quit. Pentecost tonight, as a part of the Pentecost service, is a celebration that God in Christ has delivered us from the curse of the law. And the reality of Pentecost happens every day in our life, every moment in our life. That deliverance and that wholeness. His Spirit filling us and filling us and filling us in every situation and every circumstance. And we'll never quit. Not because we're so good, so smart, or so strong. But because He is in us is so sweet. May we stand and pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come into thy presence in the name of the living Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for the grace and the mercy that you bestowed upon us. We thank you for the genuineness of salvation, that we are justified, righteous, and redeemed by your grace. You reckoned us righteous so that we could actually be righteous. And in that justified state of righteousness, being right wise unto you and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we thank you as your sons and daughters, for the fullness of that precious spirit. 
And Father, as we live in the midst of that spirit, and that spirit lives in the midst of us, we'll ever give you praise and honor and glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We will announce the invitation to him, but do not start until I have an opportunity to get down and make a comment or so. Our invitation hymn is 352. 352, if you'd like to turn to it in readiness.
It's time for that invitation, an invitation from Jesus to commune with him, a time that is open to all. God's blessings are our blessings and those that we want to share. We are honored to be here and honored to be able to go forth in the spirit of Pentecost. We have blessings on the cup. We have blessings on the bread, the bread that is the body of Christ broken for him, and the cup that is his blood shed for us. We go forth. And on that day, when Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body broken for you. Likewise, he took the wine. He said, this is a covenant of my blood for forgiveness of sins for you. Come and partake.